The question that I'm going to start with is is really from that, how do we align these designs, interactive computational technologies, in order to support well-being and to improve uh, what normal is? Because right now, and I, I was going to, you know, usually do the graphs about how normal in the UK, for instance, is quite poor uh, in terms of health. Because right now we've gotten to a place, for instance, with non-communicable diseases, uh, obesity, for instance, is the new normal. Overweight to obese, as you probably know, is past the 67% point in the UK. Uh, underslept, which the WHO is talking about as, as an uh, epidemic, is also well past the average, heading towards 77% in the UK. So we have all these markers of where our average, our normal, if you will, statistically, is not healthy or healthful or health supporting. Uh, and also our other kind of normal, what becomes normal culturally, is going to contribute to that, as will, therefore, the technologies that we embrace that reinscribe these kinds of normals. So I'll get off the first slide here. And to ask the question, to give us some context, uh, to help uh, you see sort of what we usually do over in HCI, or human computer interaction too. So what are these interactive computational devices? And also to touch back on, well, what's normal? If I've just assessed that a statistical norm is not healthful, where can we go? What does that what does that do? And and what then to come back after we've done that little exegesis through what normal might be, is to look at where does interactive computational technology have a role to play in this? How how can we help make normal better? So if we look at this first question, just for an orientation to get us all on the same page, much of this you'll recognize and know, but just as I say, to make sure that we have an understanding of where uh, somebody in HCI might be coming from in this space. This is what interactive computational devices have looked like. Uh, the women you see in this, these pictures, circa uh, World War II and a little beyond, uh, were known as computers because what they're actually doing in this image is programming a computer. And that's kind of different than what we might be used to in thinking about how programming of computer systems might work. But this, this they're not even showing a moving physical board. So it's a very physical, intense, mathematical expert process to be a computer. Uh, and then uh, th we didn't have screens. This is a fascinating thing is you're programming without screens. So it's a very abstract thing, even though you're looking at this technical stuff. Then we got screens. And this is sort of what interacting with the computer looked like. And intriguingly, this screen that you're looking at is a command line interface. So the interaction for a human with the device is through typing via keyboard, which means that you have to know and remember, recall rather than recognize, which we'll come to in a second, how uh, what the commands are for making the thing go and for, again, programming it to follow certain kinds of instructions. This interface was fantastic for people who were visually impaired. In fact, there was a kind of a golden age for uh, various accessibility issues that have become rife now for folks who were visually impaired to become computer programming experts. All of a sudden, however, human computer interaction steps in and says something about how we interact with computers could be more human, what we mean is more able-bodied, and we get this WYSIWYG interface. What you see is what you get. And this is prominent more in the late 80s towards the early 90s to be able to type something directly and what you see would be what you get. When And when they say get, they mean get when you print it out when we did such things. And so when we're looking at this uh, evolution of HCI, it is all about human computer interaction designers trying to figure out what do the icons look like? Where do you put them? What's the best place to put which icons under what menus, for instance, in order to enable you to be able to recognize a command rather than have to remember and recall the command and where do you put it to be the most efficient way to operationalize things? I've been to so many conferences about 
uh, in the even up until mm, 2003, 2004, where the hot stuff happening in HCI was about how do you design menus to be able to move the mouse to them as effectively and efficiently as possible so getting a command doesn't slow you down. Uh, that is HCI. This is also HCI, figuring out what the interaction is going to be with what's called direct manipulation interfaces, where you can actually touch something and move it and the, seemingly what you're doing happens. Though that double click thing to have something new happen is what would be called a polymorphic gesture, because sometimes when you double click something, it opens a file, it can start an application, it lets you rename it. So all of those kinds of gestures are often what is constructed as human-computer interaction research to make sure that it will then work for a human being. This is another type of interface. This is, um, in fact, cars are probably the most computationally rich environments that we step into at any time and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. This is the dashboard of uh, 2021 uh, Chevrolet Corvette. And even though it's got a steering wheel, most of us know that it's kind of power steering fly by wire. Now, if it gives you touch, it's fake touch back to get a feeling of what the road is like most often. And it's a, a very visually enriched uh, environment, not unlike a cockpit. So we see that the effect of uh, computational devices are now around us in an environment, but also they're used to design the environment. This is a buddy, Bill Buxton, who is at the University of Toronto in an alias wavefront. And one of his uh, creations was, was this digital tape to replicate how car designers actually map out the outline of a car by using masking tape. And instead of using masking tape, he created these two electrodes that could actually trace a curve or a line that could be edited and discussed on large scale screens larger than even we have commonly now to create new cars. So this is the inside outside of human computer interaction. And another part of human computer interaction is actually this kind of environment. You probably heard of the internet of things. Well, we going all the way back to the beginning again, where interacting with computational devices doesn't have a screen anymore. This entire environment of, of Liverpool Street Station in, in London is us interacting with computers whether we want to or not. And it's not just when we buy a ticket to use the underground or go through the turnstile. This is also the Mac address, it's called, the identifier on our phones, if our phones are on, monitoring us moving through the facility. And it's not that hard to connect one's phone used for a fast touch purchase to be able to unpack where somebody is, even though we're told they don't do that. So unless you, if you want to stop being tracked physically by an interactive computational device, turn your phone off. How many people are going to do that? So that is, if we ask ourselves, what are interactive computational devices? Uh, what are they and where are they? The question kind of becomes, where are they not? And how do you turn it off? So they're increasingly everywhere. They just don't appear. They've become more opaque, more transparent, in fact, because we just don't see them. So that's kind of question one. The second question is, what's normal that we want to be making normal better? We looked at some of the recent normals, but that hasn't been normal for a statistically normal period of time. So if we were to check our reference point for normal, we might want to take a look at something like this. Um, this represents something like 450,000 years of a longitudinal field study where we can see that we've evolved to have uh, various qualities in motion, in our the way our eyes work, the way our bodies work, the way our brains work uh, in a combination with movement, with the environment, with uh, uh, the microbiome, light, dark shifts, gravity, uh, et cetera. All of these are attributes of a uh, cultural normal, if you will. And here's an example. This is, uh, you may be familiar with Stephen Kinney's work. He's a Canadian uh, research chair. And so this book is from about 2007. And I was looking to see if it's, if it's been refuted since, but he, his argument, he's got two great arguments. 
or his community of researchers have two great arguments about why this image in particular is compelling to think about what normal has been for a very long period of time. He makes the argument that we probably have more shore-based living than not over the course of our evolution uh, because of the need of the omega-3s, uh, the DHA in our brains for neural transmitters optimized and uh, levels of inflammation, et cetera, and they are essential, it's an essential fat, so it's been argued. And he also suggests that this kind of environment is very food rich as well as safe, lower predators, higher, higher availability of food, which the argument is we had time to relax, to play, to grow fat brains, which take time to evolve, to get from an infant being extremely vulnerable to something that can take care of itself. So that requires some kind of protective environment. And also his argument is that uh, and we've seen this borne out in other kinds of studies, is, is that we don't get very creative when, when we're under threat. If we're running from the tiger, that's not usually the time that we, uh, or even if we're hunting the tiger, that's not usually the time that we get inventive. That's the time that we rely on skills that we've practiced and that we know. And this is where we can see accidents actually in shooting with whether it's police or uh, army officers who will go for their gun faster than they will for um, peaceful resolution of a situation, not because they're bad people, but because this is what they practiced and that's what comes out in a stressful situation. So the idea here is if you wanna be creative, you need the space to be able to relax, play, explore, have safe risk. And that's one of the biggest attractors for me of, of recognized work. Um, so when we look at this, we can say, okay, this is this is sort of how we've let's say that this is the story of how we've evolved for a very long period of time what becomes normal now just i'd also like to say that doesn't mean that it's easy it seems that some of the things that we have evolved to thrive with is being somewhat hungry not underslept but underfed we we can reboot based on some of the recent work um by folks like Sachinand and panda at the salk institute and, and Walter Longo or, and, and their studies around fasting that show that this stresses the body in a particular way that a lot, I'm probably, I uh, don't mean to be teaching you to suck eggs here, so I'll, I'll move past that, but just uh, suffice it to say that we can look at these types of interactions as indicative for both the comfortable and the discomfort that is supportive to our survival and thriving as points of interaction when we come back to look at, well, what about current uh, normals and where we can have a role with any kind of technology, in particular in my area, computational technology. So this is where I start to talk about embodied interaction. And the focus here for, again, the HCI community is that generally speaking, when the body's considered by engineers or designers, it's largely as a black box. We know that we give it certain inputs and certain outputs happen. And usually those have been considered in terms of how you move a mouse around to grab those menus and whether or not you're colorblind to determine what you should be looking at on a screen. It's, it, it doesn't get into, for instance, how our metabolism works necessarily. It's, it's all about perform, largely physical and cognitive performance within uh, confined spaces or with confined devices. And if we're starting to look at health, which my community is, I've been saying we should get into the body quite literally, crack the lid of that black box, which is how we've been treating our bodies in this domain, and get to know some of the uh, parts of it. And one of the approaches that I've proposed with embodied interaction is to see the body as the site of adaptation. And this is different than two other models that HCI has worked with somewhat. One in particular is, is actually the medical model where the body is, is only thought of as, I shouldn't say, I, I have to be careful how, how I say this, is that the body based on the profession is, is the site of, of disease, pain and suffering and that most of us encounter the medical profession when we're in pain, suffering, illness uh, and, and need to be repaired. That's not the only way of seeing the body in our culture, but it is a dominant way of approaching it in human computer interaction, in computer science. It's all, when we say health, that usually just means health care. Um, another way of seeing the body, more of my background is in, in sports science and sports performance, is to see it as the site of performance, of being an enabler of performance rather than something where you have to prevent something bad from happening. It's how do you 
engage with it to create something good to happen. And I'm and I'm not saying they're polar opposites. I'm just saying these are these are spaces on a continuum. But for what HCI can bring to the table, and I hope to explore that, is that we can look at the body as the site of adaptation, of constantly responding to stimulus, and it will adapt and change immediately to that stimulus. And I'm not going to go through this here, but generally speaking, I will set this up in my community by being able to talk about the relationship between adaptation via metab or, or biometabolism and the need to maintain homeostasis. And we might talk a little bit about allostasis and interoception, but again, this is to motivate and underpin why adaptation is a useful place to think about it, to help designers think about context in which we put our interventions and how that context has knock-on effects for the rest of the systems that interact with it, namely our systems. And so within that, um, if we want to look at that, the question might become, okay, if somebody doesn't have a deep medical education or physiological e uh, education in movement or exercise or well-being or health or illness, where do we go? Well, in a very coarse-grained way, what I've suggested is there is a really great sweet spot where we can look at interventions in terms, and when I say we, I'm talking about the engineering and design community, but also engaging with collaborators in the medical side, in the sports science side. Put coarsely, there are the processes within our body that are autonomic or automatic that, that we don't consciously engage with. Again, forgive me for repeating things you, you guys are very familiar with, but just to give you the context. So we talk about that as non-volitional processes, if you will, versus volitional processes, which might be hanging upside down from a tree, uh, arguing with your neighbor, lifting weights. Those are, we, we choose those. But there's this spot that I'm referring to as semi-volitional, uh, where I would say there are key things that we have to do for our quality of life, for our survival itself. And, and you can kind of tell these will be important because when you know, they're taken away, they're used as torture. So they probably are kind of important um, if they're going to have that kind of negative effect on us if we don't have them. And I've been talking about these as semi-volitional because we can choose uh, often if we have that privilege to choose how much, when, and what of these we actually have. And this is where we get into normal. So the, the key embodied places, those semi-volitional spots where we can engage as designers and support engagement, because we do it without computational intervention, but so what's the role of computational intervention, is what are called the in five or the embodied five. And these are move, engage, eat, cogitate, and sleep. Based on the research so far, I mean, these, these might change or more might happen, but right now the research suggests that we are wired to have all of these five. So how we have them, how we engage with them, how we interact with them is essential to our well-being. Um, look at engage. We can look at how, how anything from hormonal uh, oxytocin uh, works to how facial expressions, why do we have these if we're not communicating with others? And uh, some recent work by Feldman Barrett around, around the pattern basis of emotional responses. These um, these kinds, these kinds of, of interactions suggest, oh, also with engagement, loneliness is a bigger killer than any other the, the um, NCDs put together. I was, I was blown away by that as a statistic. So quality of engagement is in person is really important. And again, it's not easy. Uh, it can be very difficult, very challenging for us to interact with each other and, and but it can also be kind of challenging to eat. We, we learn skills on how to do this. It's interesting where we privilege skills. Uh, once upon a time, um, that kind of skill of social interaction was very important and was formally taught, and now it's kind of gone away. But anyway, what I'm suggesting here with these N5 is, is that there's, there's a range, there's a continua of, of values in each of these, and they interact with each other. And again, this is probably very obvious when you guys are looking at this to say, well, yeah, that's a, yes, those are, the, those are five things that are really important. But again, from a design perspective, it's, it's they create normal, don't they? It's, it's what we eat, how we eat, when we eat culturally with each other, not with each other, et cetera, informs our health. 
And so this is this is one way of looking at how do we support adaptation for optimal performance and well-being, because we can look then at what, and I'll talk about that when I talk about tuning in a second, we can look at what are the materials that we have access to, and then also on the other side of it, how do we figure out how to put them together to feel better, to feel how we feel better, in fact. So that's um, one part of it. The other part of it, uh, it's come a little more recently in some of the work we've been doing is what we call the circumbodied. So we've got the embodied and the circumbodied. And the circumbodied we're referring to is what are the core things similarly around us that affect every cell in our body? As you likely know, for instance, light with the suprachiasmic nuclei is, all, is affecting every clock gene in our body to synchronize our organs. And when our diurnal and circadian, circadian rhythms get out of whack, we get out of whack. And you know, that's our normal too, artificial lighting, et cetera. We're making all sorts of choices and I'll come on to that. So the, the four that I've got there, again, for the similar purpose or reasons in terms of the research quality, is that we have, we know that gravity is affecting every cell in our body. In fact, the more we learn about astronauts and space travel, the more we're learning about how gravity affects even the simplest gestures. And of course, we wouldn't have the bodies we have if it weren't us constantly orienting to gravity. Uh, same thing with air. Air quality, it, we've, we've evolved to have a particular type of interaction with air. It's different than the plants have with air uh, for energy processing and so on. The microbiome, I would argue for the same reasons as part of the symbiotic relationship that mediates so many processes that we're finding out about. Tim Denant's work um, from a couple of years ago really opened up the whole area of psychobiotics, as he calls them, which are probiotic um, that are working specifically for the vagus nerve, the gut-brain access to look at how that affects um, depression and social interaction. For example, uh, have I missed one? Gravity, air, microbiome, and light we've touched on. And again, we can look at how these are wired into our cellular level. Uh, well, I, I'm just assured that you, I don't have to make that case further, just to highlight it here, so that we've got now these, these are the, the nine sites, if you will, in multiple configurations that a designer has to think about in terms of how to help design tools that will align with supporting these properties. And one more way that we can think about this, as I said with the, the N5, is that we have continuance of movement. We can be very still, even though everything inside of us is moving. Our, our skeletal, musculoskeletal system might not be in motion seemingly, unless even when we're holding ourselves up, of course, there's, there's tension, there's contraction, et cetera. Uh, but it, that might be different than moving intensely in terms of how that relates to what we might eat and when and how much recovery we might need. And so we're capable of being able to start in one place and go to somewhere else. Also within this, if we're talking about a design space, which is something HCI will do to say, okay, what, what is our problem area that we're looking at and what are the constraints and affordances within that space that we can work with? And some of the ones that we've been suggesting within embodied interaction is around asking us explicitly, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to help somebody internalize knowledge, skills, and practice to, to be able to take care of themselves? Or do we outsource it to a device to tell us how we're doing rather than feeling it for ourselves? I was trying to do this with my coffee this morning. I usually look at a timer for when, when to pour um, hot water, etc. And I thought, well, you know what? I, maybe I should build up a better awareness of what are other cues rather than looking at an abstraction like time to be able to know when the, the coffee was ready. That's uh, That's just a real trivial example of that. But also, what are we looking at in terms of the devices themselves? Are we trying to kind of augment ourselves with this interactive technology? Or are we trying to help ourselves thrive with through technology, but without the technology? So I'll come back to these in a second. Here are a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. So one of the things that I certainly outsource uh, for lack of space and knowledge is uh, growing my own food. I don't grow my own food. I have to outsource that to grocery stores. And this is what I mean by a continuum, because on the one hand, there's outsourcing to grocery stores to bring in supplies that I will then use to prepare the food. But then on the other 
end of that, it's like take that all away, completely outsource every part of the process, trust a third party entirely to deal with not only preparing your food, but getting it to your door as well. That's an example, you might say, of one end of insourcing to, to outsourcing. Also in terms of, of devices outsourcing, uh, data capture. This is huge in all of our areas. We're data mad. And the idea of being able to put a, um, a tracker on us somehow and measure physiological signal, or not even a physiological signal, just something like how far or how much time have you spent on your very expensive Peloton bike, to use that as a prescription for figuring out how much more you should do, could do, or whatever. These are our relationships to how, how we thrive in the environment that we can look at again and are utilizing as designers. So if we take this now, the N5, the C4, this notion of continua of these variables to ask where do we want to put this technology, whatever it does, we can go back to looking at, again, what would we consider the longest normal uh, statistically that we've had. And we can look at these again, these loci of interaction and see them right here with the body of site of adaptation is that we see examples of moving, engaging with each other, food being very important, uh, having to cogitate to problem solve in terms of acquiring, in this case, potentially fending off uh, predators or capturing food, getting enough sleep is going to probably happen right in rhythm when we've tested this more recently with humans who sleep when they wish seems to work with the light cycles, uh, quality microbiomics, etc. And we can put that back into our favorite comparison in public health with uh, any sort of hunter-gatherer community. And mostly there's either African or Borneo as places that, that will look at this and to see, well, what's the difference? And one of the differences between modern hunter-gatherers and industrial nations uh, apparently is uh, quality of nutrition, not caloric density overall, but, but the nutrient density, that's not so much of a surprise, but also the amount of movement uh, is a biggie. I would say, however, that some of the things that these researchers don't look at is the fact that these folks are in more natural light environments, have more access to or explore more in a more natural biome. Uh, and by natural biome, I simply mean that has a good um, variety of bacteria to interact with as opposed to some of our more sterile and built environments where these folks can also be doing more the kind of relaxed problem solving for food gathering. Again, not saying it's easy or always available or not challenging, but that it's manageable. And if we look at uh, how folks engage, move and cogitate, this is sitting. Uh, probably not the only sitting type, perhaps there are chairs somewhere, but again, this is this is active sitting movement so that a healthy normal in this kind of context is rich in balance among the N5, rich in balance among uh, the C4. And when we look at that in terms of what our normal is to this, as again, I say this, not trying to idealize or romanticize hunter-gatherers, but just as an embodiment of, again, a longer normal is we can compare that kind of work to what we see here. This is an Amazon uh, production line, if you will, of box packing and so on. This is this is a 12 hour shift. Uh, eight hours is a short shift as I understand it. And really a contrast in terms of opportunities to mix with different kinds of environments. It's all extremely controlled. And I, w I was kind of stunned at how this hasn't changed. The left-hand side is the Ford Rouge plant, famous 1929 uh, production line. And the Amazon one right beside it, uh, if we look at, if we move on to some of the other things, we'll see more uh, move from standing in those kind of uh, specialized production line jobs to sitting most work in this country is done across levels, doesn't matter what, what, uh, what you make as an income. If it's not manual labor of some kind, it's sitting. And, it, and just as I was looking at this going, wow, that, that is not a typical UK uh, food basket for sure in that, um, while we're talking about these in five, the lack of movement, a lot of sedentarism here. And also the food that goes into a UK food basket is quite different than, than what was being idealized in that picture, except for where you see the pop bottles in the background. So 
again, a lot of processed food, a lot of high starch, not much in the way of quality proteins, um, and an abundance of calories relative to nutrient density and probably in terms of, of uh, quality. And there's been some really good science to suggest that it's not just the calorie surplus that is a problem for obesity. And of course, you guys all know this. It's also the issue of the type of calorie, in this case, the um, higher processed starches that uh, seem to ha be screwing up the insulin and building towards insulin resistance. And of course, another irony of this is here we go with one of the most affluent types of food stores is, is you know, taking these massive vehicles, again, not moving manually, physically, to get to your organic food stuffs. That's cultural norms right there. And then where do you eat the food that you might get outsourced for you to prepare? In North America, I don't have the same stats on the UK, is that um, at least one in five meals is eaten in the car uh, of this kind is not bring your own lunch. So if we also look at other types of sitting, we can see the relationship again around uh, lack of movement. This is our normal sedentary movement. It's an easy one to pick on this gal with her hand on her neck. I think, yeah, that's, I can see chronic neck pain coming there. Um, but what's our solution to this? And this is where I'm going to get a little critical of my own area again, is that we have this field called ergonomics, you might have heard of, which is supposed to help make designs for interacting with our technology uh, safer. Ergonomics is big and, for instance, hospital operating theaters to, to help reduce strain on people who are um, performing surgery. But in our offices, where we also spend a lot of time, this is an example of ergonomics. It's like, here's, oh, somebody's really hurting themselves <laughs> sitting like this. This is better. Um, so we'll get, you know, we'll spend 10 grand and, and get you, a, which is what these chairs cost practically when they first came out about 20 years ago. Now the Aaron chair is, is like, here's, here's a fantastic chair. That's going to solve your, your um, health problem. But to me, this reminds me too much of, of like needle exchange programs. It's like you're still doing these terrible drugs, uh, but we'll give you a, a, a clean needle. So at least it's not going to kill you from being a, a crappy needle. It's it's a, it's the same same principle back here. This is not solving the problem. And when we understand how vital movement is, which I will argue over here, is if we look at just a mapping of the brain, and we can see all of these areas where we're wired to manage movement. And I don't even think they got, yeah, I guess they touched on the cerebellum a little bit. And of course, we haven't peeled into the inside to look at the basal nuclei and, and the thalamus in here to, to also talk about everything coming up through uh, the, the midbrain is also going to be looking at managing movement. So I guess it's important and, and not just in the brain. Sorry, I'm just going to go on and on about this for a little bit. If we look at our 11 organ systems, because I don't think our fascia has yet become an official organ system, but the, these 11, all of them are associated with movement. And this is stuff, again, that engineers and designers in my community don't really know. And it's something that most of us in the general population don't know about how important this is. We live with, I, I don't have the quote here uh, on a slide, but Edison, light bulb guy, um, said that the you know the only only uh, role or good good role something to the effect of the only good role for the body is to carry the brain around no but that's the kind of normal culture we've evolved and so if that's the role of the body well you know put it in a chair with wheels on it and roll around the office and stay sitting because as long as the brain is working then that's great but we know that that's just not the case and in fact with so much work coming out about how sedentarism is is terrible for us um, and and we don't even need this data we can just look at really um, what what the statistics uh, of our own understanding or physiology tell us that this is not going to be a good idea so this is getting to by knowing something about the in five and how they work well and how they affect adaptation is that a designer or an engineer can start to ask questions like well how do we design things to align with how we perform optimally. What are our choices? Well, work is going to change a lot if we actually take that perspective. But here's how we operationalize it in, in my uh, space when we're using this approach to embodied interaction. We call it tuning. And it's for the same reason that you talk about tuning an instrument to resonate with itself 
or resonate with others, that adaptation in context. How do you want to support it? And sometimes it's also how you want to resist it because maybe the context is dreadful, like everybody's sitting in your office. How the heck are you supposed to be healthy in that kind of space? This is why we need to make normal better so that individuals aren't left to carry the can of their own health. And we'll come on to a project we're doing at the university around this. The way we talk about tuning, and I'll, I'll whip through this fairly quickly so that we can get to questions and I'm not taxing you guys, fatiguing you with, with too much talking so you're sitting and, and cogitating sort of on overdrive, is that tuning focuses on the notion of these three things of an experience a perceived feeling and ksp which stands for knowledge skills and practice and as designers we're making choices about what we're trying to support and how and that gets back to that insourcing to outsourcing raw to cyborg and we'll come back to that in a sec is that we're looking at a cycle here is what is the experience the experience might be i have a deadline i have to stay up late and and it hasn't become a chronic process but and and this is what i have to do and my perceived feeling from that experience is of having less sleep than I needed is that I'm getting up and I'm feeling terrible and I'm grumpy and I'm cross at everybody, but I might not know to connect those two together. So this is where potentially understanding knowledge, skills and practice about health and well-being around those in five might be important to help you debug yourself in the morning. I'm just, just touching on parts of the tuning process of the questions that we would ask as designers is where are our de are, are designs helping to unpack how do you feel how you feel what is your range of feeling like if you've never had a good night's sleep and i've worked with a lot of people like that and perhaps you have too they don't know what the art of the possible is so asking them to change what they're doing is not always easy uh, to get into that space. We can also look at what happens in that normal, for an example, uh, when you don't have the KSP. And this takes us right back to the original icon for this talk. In case you missed it, it was the alarm clock. That's an example of an interactive technology that embodies a certain normal. And this is where we have this perceived feeling because you got up with the alarm. You know, you can ask yourself, how many of you get up with an alarm? Um, what is that a sign of? Being underslept. Um, but let's let's uh, let's go with this. Is that this is normal? And so, what's the side effect? Is that well, you wake up feeling kind of crappy. You're kind of tired during the rest of the day. You think you're underslept. Uh, or you don't think you're underslept, you might not know what the problem is. And, and where's the problem in terms of a technology perspective is, is right here, is that you have a culture that is telling you that this is a great piece of technology because it will take care of you. The alarm clock will make sure you don't sleep in. And yet from what we know about that in five of sleep, that core thing about sleep is really simple. If you need an alarm to wake up, you're sleep deprived. And so what, what do we need to do in terms of design is it, we can't just kill the technology. I mean, we I do work with people to help them be able to wake up without uh, an alarm so that they are sufficiently slept. And it does mean adjusting a whole lot of things that have been taken as normal in order to rebuild a space. And I think that socially that's still too much for an individual to have to do when we make it normal culturally then we're not going to have these kinds of problems. But right now we have this problem uh, where we can't just change the technology, where the there's no such thing as a smart alarm. Basically, if you need the alarm, that's that's the problem. And the smart alarm would actually be something that was intelligent about your schedule and helped you be able to do that rebuilding. So, OK, just to 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 wind this up a little bit, uh, not to use too much of a clock metaphor, is that tuning can interact with these three things in any part of the cycle so that we can look at experience that triggers adaptation, what kind of feeling does it give you, and how do you build some knowledge, skills, and practice around that. I'm going to move ahead a little bit here, tuning metaphor of the dialing in the clock or dialing in the radio. Here's a walkthrough example to go back to the crappy desk because you have this terrible experience this perceived feeling start to having a chronic pain effect. It's gone from acute for an isolated pain to chronic. You can feel it everywhere. You d hear something about somehow you connect with knowing that learning that uh, something to do with exercise might actually help build some strength in the back and you might start to feel better. Look, you're doing some exercise now. You've learned how to do it. You have a new feeling from this perceived uh, feeling of doing the exercise and it's having these other side effects 
on your movement, on your quality of how you eat and what your body composition is and how you feel, especially because now you're dancing, you feel fantastic, which might open you up to more experiences like engaging with others, but maybe you're still a little stressed out about that. But you go through the same process of saying, well, maybe since I learned some skills over here about how to feel better, I might be able to learn some skills about how to feel better when I'm engaging with folks. And that brings you to new experiences to ask new questions and you get this new office environment. It's still not perfect, but at least you're able to move a little bit more, stand up and walk around a bit more. And uh, that has enabled you to feel better, gain knowledge, skills and practice and move on with your life. I would get into what the design framework is here a little bit more, but we can come back to that. Suffice it to say, if you're interested in designing interventions and working on, in this space in mobile health and digital health, this is a framework that might be assistive there. One thing I would suggest that we can start to ask about too, when we start this question is we don't start with, you know, the fact that you're, you're not walking very much, or you're not sleeping enough. It's like, what do you want? What do you want to, to do? What, what do you want to feel? And then we can use the N5 and C4, tuning those to support that. And how do we tune? I'm, I'd love to talk about monasteries is this difference between our over-specialization, like that Amazon workforce that just does that one thing for eight hours, just like we do this one thing for eight hours. We have a little more variety in academic knowledge work, but it's still pretty specialized. We're not getting out and putting our hands in the dirt too often, unless that's our specialization. So again, we can start to look at how we want to design things, to ask questions about what culture are we building? What is our technology saying about our values and about our alignment of our designs with how we work best? Are we going for sort of this kind of notion of, of rawness where we, we can handle everything with very limited technology or there might be a value sometimes in going full cyborg like Robocop here to be able to augment certain processes, but maybe not forever, maybe just temporarily. The way we talk about it in our work, we have a methodology called experiment in a box in which effectively we're trying to suggest try before you buy is that we set up heuristics that can be instantiated by an individual, for instance, an eat box uh, that we talk about in that paper is try greens first. Before, before you have the whites, before you have anything, try greens first and see how you feel. And then sort of like try greens, then proteins, greens, reds effectively, um, and then wait we and, and see how you feel at each step. And we have the um, tools that help people assess how they're doing with this, but it's always connected back to, look, your green percentage is going up over the week. How are you feeling? How's your energy? We guide the engagement, but we don't tell people what to do. It's like, how do you make sense of this? And the reason for this is this is to build up their own knowledge, skills, and practice so that they can thrive. And this is something Bear Grylls uh, is a great example of heuristics we'll look at in a second. And he talks about the rules of survival never change whether you're in a desert or in an arena. I don't know how many of us are ever in an arena to actually do something in the arena. But anyway, the same thing with thriving. Is it the rules of thriving, the N5, the C4, they're there, where you put yourself on that, how you interact with those, pretty much you're going to determine how you feel and what is normal. So what's the payoff of this? The payoff of this heuristic-based approach where you try something, you get the opportunity to experiment, like how do greens feel, is that we've seen folks develop practices that last, that it... Um, Project, one of the projects in the, that we reported on the paper started in 2014. There's a, even a video that they, they did, the group did, associated with that um, process. And I talk to these folks annually now, and they're still using the heuristics that they learned in that practice. Why? Because they work and they feel better and they're pretty easy to put into practice. Uh, and they've made sure that their environments that they've walked into as their jobs have changed support that. Not everybody can do that. This, this was a pretty affluent crew. So when we look at here, what I mean by instantiating heuristics uh, to have that freedom is that context of adaptation will change, but the principles are always the same, but you still need to know what to do in those different contexts. So here, Bear Grylls in the jungle or forest and knows what protein is. This is this is one of his heuristics. Protein first, then shelter, then water. I would have thought it would be water first, but apparently not. No, it's protein. So what does protein look like in this forest? What does it look like in the desert? What does it look like in Seattle? 
So these are the types of things you still need to know to be able to instantiate. You need the knowledge, skills, and practice to be able to instantiate how you feel to get back to, again, developing personal health heuristics. One experiment in the boxing that we've got going right now with research innovation services and iSolutions, our participant communities right now, is looking at how does it feel to actually practice strength, learn about strength and practice it during work. Up to a maximum of 35 minutes a day, the research says that this will help mitigate sitting and it will also help you engage with work better, does it? What happens if, as you learn the skills about how to build strength for yourself, move, what's the difference between building a strength on one day, having some aerobic kind of strength, endurance strength on another day, how does that affect your work? And again, this is the interesting thing here is that it's building up knowledge, skills, and practice for the individual, but it's also building up potential evidence base for the university to say, maybe we should be the first university in the country that supports this for our staff because it adds value to uh, how we engage in work. So wrapping up here, the question that we started with was, how do we align our interactive computational technology designs to support making normal better. I hope I've made the case that the reason we need to think about this is that our current normal compared to our previous normal, uh, longitudinal normal, sort of sucks. We've, we've violated the principles that have been what has caused us to evolve into the beings that we are, that 450, well, some people say 350 to 400 years of, of our, our type of uh, sapient hominid. Uh, and so one of the solutions that we proposed here is we have to change uh, the, not just the technology, that's that's kind of potentially one place we can begin as a guerrilla operation, and that's sort of what these experiments in a box are doing, to help an individual learn how to become more aligned with the N5 and the C4, to become more resilient with knowledge, skills, and practice. But that is only a hack, really. What we need to be working on, and I'm talking to uh, generally at the engineering and design community, and I and I hope you'll join with us, is, is to say we need to work on how to translate this from the individual level to the infrastructure level. Because if the infrastructure weren't sedentary, uh, I have I have said that before when people have said, well, how do you stop sedentarism? It's like, well, burn the chairs. Some people suggest that might not work. Uh, so if if we have an emphasis on looking at the infrastructure level to make it easier to address challenges for especially time poor and cash poor people to be able to eat well, sleep well, and so on. If we start to affect those changes, then that's going to be easier to support. But in the meanwhile, until we get there, uh, until we get to scaling up that space, we're kind of starting where we can, or at least our work is starting where we can. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, a little bit running longer than I had hoped. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take whatever we've got time for here. And I hope you will uh, bug me on Teams or email or wherever uh, to continue the conversation if you feel like Ooh, there's a conversation to be had. So um, over over to you then. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I, I thought that was that was fascinating. I, I have to admit that much of what you've said is is 